Hello everybody, welcome to the Ask Me Anything for the CrossFit Linchpin private Facebook group. And it is uh, December 17th, 2020. I've got some great questions, I've got my answers prepared, I have my coffee, and so let's just get right into it. Sip of the coffee to start. All right, most upvoted question was from Eric. Let's see, I feel like there was two here. Um, okay. Eric says, if I have the equipment to perform the regular workout, do you see any benefit from doing the LEO? And LEO stands for Limited Equipment Option, aka our dumbbell option every day. What would be the ben benefits? And is there any minimum commitment uh, of time to see some results from doing that? So, Short answer, uh, are there benefits to doing the limited equipment option, even if you have all the gear in the world? Short answer, yes, absolutely. This is the easiest question I've ever had to answer. 100% yes, there's not even a 1% no, 100% yes. Uh, the dumbbells are just fantastic, and if you're curious as to what the difference or benefits would be, this might be an oversimplification, but I feel that it is illustrative and beneficial, right? Let's say you have a 100 pound barbell and a 100 pound sandbag. Do they, they weigh the same, but do they feel the same doing power cleans, ground to shoulders, squats, whatever it happens to be? Absolutely not. They feel wildly different, even though the loading is exactly the same. You can use that same sort of analogy, if you will, to the dumbbells. You've got a 100-pound barbell and you've got two 50-pound dumbbells. Both of them are the same weight, mathematically speaking, but they certainly do not feel the same. Your body does not react the same um, with those two implements. There is tremendous benefit and value and variance in grabbing those dumbbells, even if you have access to just the regular gear all the time. Uh, the unilateral work, you know, one side of your body can't compensate for maybe a, a lack on the other side, It's which you may not notice, maybe with a barbell, you may notice, but maybe not. But it will become readily apparent with a dumbbell in each hand if one side feels different than the other or is working a bit easier than the other. Increased stabilization you know, a 100 pound barbell for thrusters is certainly challenging. There's no doubt about that. But the level of coordination, accuracy, agility, balance, you know, the neurological components to get that overhead versus a pair of 50 pound dumbbells. So you're still getting the same amount of loading overhead, still the same thruster, right? But it's certainly the demands are not the same on your body. Your body has to work harder with the dumbbells your brain has to stay more engaged and there's more thought about where they are in space and to keep them where you want to be than with a barbell. And it is, it's fantastic. So it's a strong yes for me. Grab the dumbbells um, anytime you can. They are magical. They are magical unicorns. As I saw Sarah uh, wrote right there, I could not agree more. In my perfect, beautiful, amazing world, everybody would get to do a limited equipment option, a dumbbell workout once a week, right? So we post five workouts a week. If you're doing one of them with the dumbbells, that's 20% of the training is done with dumbbells. That's fantastic. If I could have an even more special and magical world of paradise, it would be great if a couple times a week you did that. So two out of five, 40% of the training done with dumbbells, I don't see anyone getting shortchanged if they did two out of the five workouts each week, the dumbbell option. As a matter of fact, I only see good things happening with their fitness based upon that. So it's a big yes for me. And then if you want to have not just a regular treat, but an extra special treat, then don't just do a, a normal workout of the day every now and then with the dumbbells go ahead and do a heavy day. You want to dance with the devil, do the limited equipment option when a heavy day comes up. If it's a heavy squat or deadlift or 
the clean and jerk, whatever it is, man, and you're used to just doing the barbell option, embrace those dumbbells, embrace those dumbbells, and they will get you outside your comfort zone and hit you in some areas that haven't been hit in a while and potentially expose some weaknesses that you didn't even know you had like few other things. And now what's cool is, instead of me just saying this, now with so many people following the private track and uh, due to lockdowns in various stages all around the world, a lot of people have been forced to become limited equipment option members, even if they originally had no desire of being part of the dumbbell crew. And some of these people, the barbells went away for months. They did not touch a barbell, so they couldn't quote unquote lift heavy, right? I mean, you can't put more weight on them. If you've got a pair of 50 pound dumbbells, that's all you've got. You've ne you're never going to lift more than a pair of 50 pound dumbbells. And now, instead of me just being the ramblings of a crazy person, we have the actual real world stories of hundreds of these members of the Cross Lynchpin private track from all around the world telling the same story, which is, man, didn't get a touch of barbell for three months, did the dumbbell work, came back in, gym finally opened, I finally got a barbell in my hand, and the stories are either, I was shocked that, geez, I didn't lose anything. I'm, I'm right back where I was on the barbell, even though I've had the dumbbells, that's confusing, or I can't explain it, but I just hit a 10 pound clean and jerk PR, that doesn't make any sense, or you know, fill in the blank, those stories are now so common and ubiquitous that you can't, you can't deny them. The dumbbells deliver the goods. And so if you've got access to them, please, 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 Embrace them and use them, and they will be your new best friend. Dumbbells are awesome. Dumbbells are awesome. Okay, so that was question number one, the most upvoted question. Question number two, also a good one. Everybody's crushing it today with the questions. Rory, let's see, Rory, where is your question, Rory? Here we go. Rory's question is, what is the optimal substitution for a pull-up movement? If you're doing the, the Leo, limited equipment option, the dumbbell option, if you're doing the Leo with the dumbbell, but don't have a set of rings and don't have a pull-up bar, what's a good substitution? Same goes for running. What's a good running substitute to get in cardio if you don't have any of the machines, you know, no bike, no rower? Rory is lucky enough to live in a part of Canada that's already quite snowy and icy thus far. He's been substituting burpees in place of running, things of that nature. Um, thanks for the programming, happy holidays. Happy holidays to you as well, Rory. Excellent question. Okay, so, uh, you know, not having a pull-up bar, that's tough. Um, if I could have anything in the world, it would be for you to have a pull-up bar. Save your pennies. Get a solid bomb-proof one built by Rogue, bolted to your wall. Life's awesome. But let's just say for whatever reason that's not possible. The pull-up is one of those things that it's, they're so, the pull-up is tough to replicate. It can be done, and I'm about to tell you some substitutions for it. But it's one of those things where, you know, some substitutions get really close. Hey, I don't have a whatever, fill in the blank with something else. You're like, eh, yeah, it's a little different but you're still getting pretty darn close. The pull-up's one of those things where everything else is just second best. So if you can get that pull-up bar, great. Okay, but let's assume that you cannot. So here, here are my recommendations. You said you're doing the dumbbell work. So bent over rows, one arm dumbbell rows. You're rowing in a different direction. I understand that than the, how you'd be pulling your body with the pull-up but that raw, beautiful pulling towards your body capacity of one arm dumbbell rows will undoubtedly transfer to your pull-ups when you can get yourself back on the pull-up bar. So embrace dumbbell rows. You can also do, and if you're unfamiliar with this movement, just go to YouTube and type it in, dumbbell lat pullover. And that is kind of you laying on a bench, you're holding the head of one dumbbell with both hands, you lower it back behind your head, you pull it back up, and that's a great just back, lats, chest builder. 
So I would also uh, embrace the dumbbell lat pullover. Now you said you're buried in snow and ice up there in Canada, but you know, weather dependent, environment dependent, things of that nature, if you can get creative and obviously do it safely, right? I don't want anybody getting hurt, but if you can get creative based upon your environment, if you can find, you know, a sturdy tree branch, a beam in your house or porch or something that you can loop over that, a towel and do like towel pull-ups, or if you have a length of rope and you can put the rope hanging over there and put two big knots that you can um, grab onto and you can kind of use that as handles to do, you know, ring rows or poles or pull-ups or something like that. Anything that you can do if you're creative, of course, stress test it to make sure that it will, you know, from an engineering standpoint, will tolerate your, your weight and loading. There are some creative things that you can do. Um, and there are also some ways to do like rows using a sturdy, and this is the keyword sturdy, pull up or coffee table if it is sturdy enough and has the, the proper distance. Uh, people get pretty darn creative to row some things to their body. So that's those are the quick things that I would do. And you know, in all honesty, I should probably make a little bit of like a linchpin instructional video specifically on this topic. Like, hey, I don't have a pull up bar, what should I do? So that might be a good a good thing for me to, to dive into. Okay, second part of your question. No bike, no rower, and it's just death ice up there in Canada, so what can you do? Sure, you can do burpees, but who in the heck wants to do burpees all the time? You'll become just a raging psycho animal of fitness, but you probably won't want to do them all the time. So let's say a 400 meter gets programmed, there's two meters of snow on the ground up there in Canada. Let's just say on average that we need to replace that work and let's think about the time domain first. So we gotta replace about two minutes of work. And you could do that with multiple things. It just depends on which of these would treat you well. You could just in place of each 400 meter run or in place of each 500 meter row, you could skip rope for two minutes. I don't really care if it's double unders or single unders, just skip rope for two minutes. And that just depends on, again, the individual user. Are your calves and Achilles tendons okay with that volume of running or jumping? You know, because for example, you know, the other day, what was that workout we had with the four rounds of 800 meter runs, wall ball shots, and rope climbs? Well, now all of a sudden, if you're replacing that with jumping rope, if you're replacing every 400 meters with two minutes, well, then you're placing 800 meters with four minutes. There's four rounds in that workout. So now, if you look at that workout, this is why not all workouts are this, you know, they're not the same and every substitution doesn't work beautifully all the time. I'm not gonna recommend that anybody jumps rope for 16 minutes in place of doing those 800 meter runs. So it depends upon the workout. Right now, if we're talking something like Helen, there's three rounds for time. There's three 400 meter runs. Well, then three two minute intervals of, of doing some single unders might treat you well, but it just depends upon the individual athlete and the tolerance and volume that your calves and Achilles can take because it could add up you know, quickly. So let's talk about some other stuff with the skipping rope. And maybe you do you know, one option in round one, a different option in round two, and a different option in round three. Yeah, you gotta input that into beyond the whiteboard and say, hey, this is what I did but it will keep your body feeling good and you will be able to rep replicate the intended stimulus as best as possible. So as we get skipping rope, you could also do jumping jacks for that period of time. And if that sounds like something you would do in elementary school and it sounds too easy, I'm here to tell you, if you haven't done two minutes of nonstop jumping jacks in a while, they're probably harder and more taxing than you realize let alone doing that for a multi-round workout. So jumping jacks would be another thing that I could potentially put in there as well. Running in place. You know, there's jogging in place and running in place. If you're just shuffling your feet in place and do that for two minutes, you'll get something out of it. But if you're running in place and if you get your knees anywhere near like the level of your waist and you're just moving up and down like that for two minutes, Two minutes will feel like an eternity of doing high knees. You will wish 
that there was not snow and ice on the ground, you could go out and actually just do the 400 meter run. So those would get uh, plenty challenging as well. And then of course, you know, you could do something like your burpees, mountain climbers or whatnot. Um, but I would do most of those before I would do burpees, you know. And you could, like I said, in a multi-round workout, you could do potentially a different one in each round and you would not be shortchanged. You would be good to go. So that would be my recommendations uh, for that one. Good question. Excellent question, Rory. Next one is from Nasos. All right, here we go. When life becomes normal again, won't that be lovely? When life becomes normal again and we arrange the linchpin meetups, you know, so the goal is once we can actually meet in public again to do some linchpin meetups. And you arrange the linchpin meetups, is the workout already planned? Is it dumbbell thrusters and burpees? <laughs> this, thanks for everything and that this community has been the best vaccine against this weird year. Very, very cool. Dumbbell thrusters and burpees, I'll tell you what, you don't have to twist my arm hard on that. That would be a beautiful combination if everybody showed up with some burpees. We'll have to see where we can meet up and what the equipment is that we'll have available, but no matter what, we will make sure that we have some quote unquote fun, that unique, special CrossFit fun. Okay, Rick. Next most upvoted question was from Rick which was not fitness related, but it won't take me more than a second to answer. From Rick W., what made you decide to settle down in the Northwest? Well, I'll tell you what, Rick, as I look out my window and it's just pouring down rain today, as it did yesterday, and as it will do tomorrow and the next multiple days after that, I also ask myself, why did I settle down in the Northwest? The truth is, it's just a story all this time, right? just fell in love, had never had a choice, never had a choice. So when I met my wife, Emily, she's got two children, two amazing young boys from a previous marriage, and there's joint custody with that, you know, not to give you a tremendous amount of, you know, walk down memory lane with my uh, personal life here, but, uh, you know, joint custody. So the families are here in Washington. So, you know, there was never an opportunity to move at this, at this point in time, given the fact that we had joint custody with the kids. So, well, no matter what, her family's all up here in Washington State anyway, so there would have been some sort of a draw to be here no matter what, but the, the kids definitely cemented that as well. So, you know, we're here for at least, you know, as long as the, uh, you know, the kids are doing what they're doing with school until they're 18, that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, so I'm a stepdad to two amazing, awesome, uh, young men. They're 9 and 11 right now. And I came into their lives when they were about 3 and 5. And they are just the coolest little people on the face of the earth. They are, they are phen phenomenal. So yeah, that's why I'm up here in the, in the Northwest. There may be some other places I would prefer to be, but eh, what are you going to do? All right, next question from Jill. She know how to she know how to get a whole bunch of likes. She mentioned the word bench press. You just mention the word bench press, you're gonna get some likes. So here's Jill's question. You've programmed the waves for deadlift and squats, waves being you know two, three, five, ten, two, three, five, ten, four for reps. Uh, any chance you'd ever do that with the bench press? Just to test it out and answer all the questions that are asked about bench pressing. Okay, short answer, probably not. <laughs> I don't want to lie to you. Um, now, pause, you know, before uh, everybody gets whatever. You know, and the reason that I say probably not, and it's not a hard no, but it's a probably not, is using our time um, to the utmost of our ability, optimizing it, using it wisely, and doing movements that get the most bang for our buck are predominantly would occupy the programming as it should be. And there's just a whole bunch of other pressing that is higher in the pecking order than the bench press. And that is 
you know, nobody should quote snipe me and say, oh, Sherwood said the bench press isn't important and it's not a good lift. And it's not, it's not what I'm saying at all. It's a wonderful lift. But when we're prioritizing things, the bench press is outranked by a whole bunch of other stuff that we do on a more regular basis and has some good transference, wonderful transference actually to the bench press. And this was a conversation that popped up a little while ago in the private Facebook group and people were talking about how they hadn't benched in quite some time, for one reason or another did, and was shocked to find out how well everything else that we did transferred to the bench press. And that's really what it comes down to because the transference, in my experience, works one way, but it doesn't work the other. You know, if we get good at strict shoulder press, push press, push jerk, split jerk, overhead squats, handstand walking, ring muscle ups, dips, push ups, the whole nine yards, all of that pressing translates to capacity on the bench press, even though we don't really do it. But if we did a bunch of bench pressing, it wouldn't work the other way around. And I, and I know that you're not asking that we should do a tremendous amount of bench pressing, I get that. But here's what else I will say. If you feel like knocking some out, by all means, green light, go, you know, have a blast, go knock it out um, and see how it treats you for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the interesting things that I played around with a little bit ago you know, because like I said, I've been very vocal with having terrible shoulders from the military and motorcycle wreck. So some days I can go overhead, some days I can't go overhead. And even when I can, it's never with a tremendous amount of weight. It's just, that's just what I've done to my neck and shoulders, sadly, by some of the choices I've made in my life. When Lynchpin Test 7 came up a bit ago, which is four rounds for time of four power cleans, four front squats, and four jerks, at 205 pounds for the men, 145 pounds for the women, that wasn't going overhead for me. Power clean, fine. Front squat, fine. Jerks, negative. And so on that day, uh, I do a lot of strict ring dips in place of overhead pressing, you know, just again, because I do what my body allows me to do. But on that day, I was feeling a little froggy and I can't remember the last time I bench pressed. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to set up the bench press and I'm going to put 205 pounds on the bench press and just do the workout. And when it comes, I have to do the power cleans, the front squats, and when it comes time to do the jerks, instead of doing the jerks, I'm going to slide under the bar and bench press 205 pounds, which I could not tell you the last time I benched 135. And did the workout and did it just fine. And 205 felt just fine, which is shocking given the fact that we never bench press. So again, there really is something to that uh, to that transference. So that's kind of a, why we do what we do. There is a classic CrossFit named benchmark workout that has bench press in it. And I actually have it scratched down even before Jill asked this question as a, just something fun that I might try to work into the program in the future. So bonus question for the day, what is the name of that workout that has bench press in it, and what is that workout? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it as I sip my coffee, and then I'll tell you what it is. Ready? Begins with an L. Lin. Lin. L-Y-N-N-E. And Lin is, if memory serves, five intervals of max reps bench press at body weight followed by max reps of pull-ups. You do that five times and you rest as needed between each one of those. And, oh, Linda, you're right, Jamie. Linda also has a bench press in it. The one I was thinking of was Lynn. And uh, I think Lynn might have to make an appearance because it's just a beautiful push-pull kind of a deal. The bench press paired with high volume kipping pull-ups, it is a stinger. Great workout to do right before you go to the beach, but it is a stinger. So that might have to, that might have to make an appearance. And, and unlike Linda, which is a wonderful workout, but it requires three barbells, which in and of itself is limiting for some folks. With Lynn, you just need one barbell for the bench press and a pull-up bar. So Lynn's a good one. Okay, next question. Here we go. Nurez. Question about treadmills. Regular treadmill versus assault versus manual. What should be used when runs or sprints are programmed? 
will all three allow us to achieve the desired stimulus? Is one preferred over the other? You know, um, call me crazy, but I, I'm certainly open to the fact that I'm incorrect here. But I would lump the air runner and, and assault runner into the manual treadmill category because, you know, almost the definition of a manual treadmill is that it's powered by the user. It's not electric by nature. So when you say regular treadmill, assault runner, or manual, I'm not sure what else you mean by or manual. You're just kind of lumping all the rest of them in there. But I'm going to put assault runner, air runner in with the manual treadmills and say we've got those, your self-powered treadmills. Uh, your true forms, things like that. And then we have your regular electric treadmill that you plug in. And so his question is, will all three allow us to achieve the desired stimulus? Is one preferred to the other? So question number one, will all three allow us to achieve the desired stimulus? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I mean, the mere fact that you are running, even though I know that on a self-powered, excuse me, on an electric treadmill, it's not exactly the same as running, you know, but I, I get that but it's far better than not doing it. And you can make up for, I don't even wanna say the word advantage, that's not the word that I'm looking for, but whatever little advantage maybe you have by the fact that you know, you're setting the pace and it's moving the belt for you by just you know, giving yourself a little bit of incline on there and, and, and make that thing quite uncomfortable. Not a huge incline, but a little bit of incline, you know, 3% and, and get after it. So that will do the trick. And then you've got your manual, self-powered treadmills, which are just nasty and beautiful and effective. Um, if I had access to both standing in front of me, both would do the trick. I would lean towards the manual one just because uh, the effort level required, um, I think they're just a better, they're just a better unit, quite frankly. However, uh, if you only have access to the traditional electric one, you'll be fine. The only thing that I will say is if you, if a workout of the day does come up and you are going to do it on a manual treadmill, right? Air runner, assault runner, a true form or whatnot. In general, it's a nice idea to take whatever the prescribed distance is and reduce it by about 25%. So if it's a 400 meter run, maybe we're doing Helen. If you are doing it on an electric treadmill, then yeah, you do a 400 meter run, crank up the incline a little bit, and then you're, you're solid, right? If you're doing it on the manual treadmill, I wouldn't run 400 meters on there, I would probably run 300 meters on there in each round of Helen. So I would reduce the distance by about 25%, but you will be, you'll be good to go. Okay, um, all right. Next question is the final question before the, the shout outs, and it's from Eddie. It's a fantastic question. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie M, here we go. I'm new here, so my question might be a bit incorrect, but I'm just going on what I can see. Heavy days and heavy lifting, looks like it happens about once a week. You know, if, if strength is, is critical, wouldn't it be more beneficial to have heavy days two or maybe three days a week? Or maybe two heavy days with heavy accessory work, et cetera, et cetera. So, Excellent question, um, and quite frankly, a question that if I had a dollar for every time that I was asked it, I would be doing this live video from my home in Malibu. It's, um, okay, I'm pod, if, you, if you're listening to this when it eventually gets done uh, and, it is, and it is a podcast, not a video, you didn't lose the audio track. I'm just thinking as to how deep down the rabbit hole we'll go right now. It's a great question. Okay. We'll go medium down the rabbit hole, medium. We'll go until I run out of coffee. So first of all, uh, do people, you know, basically should there be more heavy days? Should there be more strength, right? So do more, would, and you have to assume that that question is being asked in the assumption that that would obviously benefit people. You know, so another way to say it is, would more heavy lifting benefit people because obviously if it wouldn't benefit people why do it it'd be nonsensical so do people need to lift more my short answer to you is yes however here's the other part do people also need more conditioning the answer is also yes 
And the other question, do people need to significantly improve their gymnastics capacity? The answer also is yes. It's yes to all. And But for some reason, I think, and I don't know if it's because the CrossFit games and we just see these, you know, they look great on Instagram, look how strong everybody is, whatever, that I think the narrative gets unnecessarily jaded towards one of those three modalities. So if we have weightlifting, monostructural, and gymnastics, right, monostructural meaning um, conditioning, if you will, that it's, there's this assumption in, in everything that I have seen in doing this for you know, you know, 16 plus years, the, the assumption, which I believe is erroneous, is that if I increase my strength, that will increase my fitness and will pull up the other two modalities as well. That if I just increase my, my strength and everything else kind of stays the same, I'm gonna be this fitter athlete in the gym. And I can kind of see where that comes into the case, but I that has not been what plays out in reality in front of my very eyes with the literally thousands of people that I've interacted with. So getting back to the earlier point, people need everything. They need to improve their strength. They need with the barbells, external objects, weightlifting, if you will. They need to improve their conditioning and they need to improve their gymnastics. If you want to really go down a rabbit hole on this, Eddie, and it's a great question and everybody should, if you haven't done this, we did a full podcast just on this. So go check out Lynchpin Conversations number 42. And it's entitled, Extra Lifting is Not What Most People Need to Improve Their Fitness. And you know, here's an interesting thing, just for, um, now strength is king, don't get me wrong, but there's an asterisk there as well. Strength is king if you are a power lifter if you are an Olympic lifter, if you are a specialist. And if you are a specialist, that's fine. We're all in this together. We're all trying to live great, healthy lives. I've got, I've got no ill will for you, rock on. Um, but if you are not a power lifter or an Olympic lifter or, or a, an athlete with a dedicated bias, a dedicated specificity, if you are actually, your goal is to be fit work capacity across broad time and modal domains, a well-rounded athlete, you know, GPP, general physical preparedness, is what you want to dedicate your life to, uh, long-term health and fitness, then strength is not king, and neither is conditioning, and neither is gymnastics. We're greedy, we want it all, and we can have it all, and we can develop it all together uh, in a way that um, raises it all beautifully. I think Another potential thing is, well, though, the strength part might be more sexy than the conditioning elements and the gymnastic elements. So that in and of itself uh, lures some people in. Um, where was I going with that? It went somewhere. It went somewhere and it's gone for the moment. Um, oh, I think if you tested everybody that it would disprove this theory quite rapidly, okay? so. If we are crossfitters and we are true crossfitters, we have the, you know, the theoretical hierarchy of the development of an athlete, which is this pyramid looking thing. And it's in the CrossFit Journal, you can find that theoretical hierarchy of the development of an athlete. At the base is nutrition, you should focus on that first. After you actually fuel the system properly, the next layer which you build upon that is your metabolic conditioning, your body's ability to process oxygen, we need to make sure things are happening well with that. After that, we have the proper fuel, we have the ability to process oxygen properly with our metabolic conditioning. Then the next layer upon that is gymnastics movements, body weight movements, right? If you can't move your body as it is and do it well and consistently, you know, mechanics, consistency, and then intensity, why in the world am I gonna load that structure? Then only after that is done properly do I load that structure through weightlifting, throwing, things of that nature, and the culmination up top is sport. But it can be very easy to um, to want to flip that around, right? In working on the conditioning piece and the gymnastics piece, again, 
words are powerful things. And I try to, I try to explain this in a truthful way, but sometimes the truth can sting. And it's, I don't say these things to make them sting. That is not my intention. My intention is just to truthfully put out the message of what I have learned from doing this for so long, uh, the experiences that I've had, the education that I've had, and, and pass those lessons along to everybody else in, in an unbiased fashion, even if the truth is unpopular or uncomfortable. I think there's also a wonderful and relatable desire to embrace the barbell work or to get, um, you know, to, to go towards the strength one because it's easier to see the gains and they come a bit quicker. When you slap another little plate, even if it's a little change plate on your back squat, it feels good. You know, it just happened. It's up there. Deadlift went up 10 pounds. Going and, and you see it happen and it takes a little bit less time. Going to the track week after week to try to whittle down your 800 meter sprint time, most people will probably quit before they see a meaningful improvement in their 800 meter time because of the level of pain and discomfort that you need to be willing to embrace to improve your 800 meter run time. So I don't use the term easier because don't get me wrong, grinding out a 10 rep or a 20 rep back squat or really pouring your heart into a five by five deadlift to the point that you think you feel faint in your head, that's not easy. So I'm not trying to say that it's easy. So please don't take this the wrong way, but it's in a different universe than trying to get your 800 meter run pace down. And then you get on the other side of it and it's just not fun at all to try to get a two minute L sit. It's gonna take a super long time, like over a year or two long time. Most people are gonna give up along the way and embrace something else that they kind of see the, the, the payoff a little quicker but it shouldn't be interpreted that way. Just because the payoff or the road is longer does not mean that it's less valuable or less impactful or less important. It just means that there's fewer folks that see it all the way through. And it's my job as the leader of this community, which is why you know one of the things that we say is we program what is effective, not what's popular. And if more heavy days would get the community fitter, that's what I would be doing because I want Lynchpin to be the best. Um, I, without question, I want Lynchpin to be the best. And so everything that I've learned, I put into Lynchpin. And so if there was something that everything that I've experienced has taught me was a better way to get most people fitter faster, that is precisely what we'd be doing. But we're not doing that for a reason. And we probably go heavier even a bit more than you realize. There's at least one a week, you know, that because we have our classic heavy days, your seven by ones, your five by fives, whatever it happens to be. But then we also have the heavy days at a high heart rate, which are sneaky and maybe, you know, and they're mixed modality, there's other things in there. And so at first glance, and they're usually percentage work. And so at first glance, it may not seem like it's that classic heavy day, but you don't just get strong on a seven by one, a five by five, a set to three, a doubles kind of a day. There's a whole lot of other ways to get strong that don't look like a classic heavy day. And one of the other ones is that heavy day at a high heart rate. And as a matter of fact, we had one yesterday, whether you realize it or not, we had um, three rounds for time of some calories in the air bike some chest to bar pull-ups, and then I believe it was sets of 12 overhead squat at 50% of your one rep max. That's not making you weaker. That's for darn sure. That is going to make you stronger, but it doesn't look like your classic lifting day. And so a lot of that stuff is, is mixed in there, whether you realize it or not. And the other interesting thing is I truly believe all right, I know I said we we're going medium down the rabbit hole. Maybe this is 60%, okay? Instead of 50% down the rabbit hole, we, we punched a little further than I thought. Here's what I truly believe also, and this is what um, my eyes have taught me, is if we lined up, I don't, even, I don't even know how you'd say your average CrossFitter, right? So this is instantly fantasy land because we can't really measure it. Lined up your average CrossFitters, okay? And we 
measured their weightlifting capacity, their barbell capacity, their conditioning capacity, and then their gymnastics capacity. Here's what I think we would find. Here's what life and my time in CrossFit has taught me. This is what we would find. Most people, even though they think and feel that they have so far to go with the barbell, that their strength is lacking so much, that that modality, weightlifting, is most likely better than their capacity with it regards to conditioning or gymnastics. The barbell snatch is the most complicated lift in the world that you can do with a barbell. Nothing is more complicated. And darn near everybody can do it. I didn't say you can do it well. I didn't say you don't have plenty of work to do. I didn't say that you're lifting the weight that you want to lift. But even if we get you down to a PVC pipe or an empty barbell or just 10 pounds on each side, most people can snatch. They can do it. And they're a work in progress, but they can do it. So when the answer comes out like, can you snatch and clean and jerk? You're like, yeah, it's not where I want it to be, but yeah, I can do it. Then if we went out to the track, you know, and we, and we could measure those lifts upon other average lifts, your back squat, front squat, and they'd be wherever you want to rate them from amateur to intermediate to advanced, blah, blah, blah. Then if we got you out on the track and we did an 800 meter run and compared them to times of what actual competitive times for an 800 meter run are, I think it would be shocking to most people how far off they are in their conditioning compared to what they thought. Go look up some 800 meter times, see how you fare. Go look up some lifts, you know, from some amateur competitions with just weightlifters and see how close you are to those lifts. Obviously, you'll be below them, obviously. But then go look up some, you know, collegiate track meets or something like that and see how close you are to the 800 meter times you're a universe away. You're not, you're not even in the same solar system. Then on the gymnastics side of the house, we don't even want to talk about gymnastics because maybe your 800 meter run, you know, it's not where you want it to be, but you can do the 800 meter run, right? Just like you can do a barbell snatch. When the, when the question comes out, can you do this? You go, yes. Ah, you know, I wish I could lift a bit more, but yes, I can do it. Can you do the 800 meter run? Yes. Do I need to work on it? Yeah, I need to work on it, but yes, I can do it. Now enter the world of gymnastics, okay? Now there's gymnastics and then there's real gymnastics. Gymnastics can be overly simplified in, in the world of CrossFit. We just say it's body weight movements, okay? And that's our pull-ups, ring muscle-ups, handstand walks, things of that nature. Then there's the sport of gymnastics, okay? Just like, and now when we talked about the barbell, we talked about in the world of weightlifting, we talked about doing the most complicated thing in the world you can do with a barbell. And the answer was yes, you could do that, which is incredible. Now in the world of, of actual gymnastics, like collegiate gymnastics, in, in the realm of classifying movements to most complicated in the world, advanced, intermediate, and beginners, most of us can't even do beginner movements. The heck with intermediate or advanced. The answer is it is to hardcore, no, we cannot do that. Can you do a planche? No, can you do, I mean, whatever, no, no, no. The answer would be a bunch of no's. And you're like, when you raise your hand and you go, I can do a ring muscle up, in the actual world of gymnastics, a ring muscle-up is not a scored movement. You are awarded no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. The ring muscle-up is just what you're expected to do to get onto the rings to actually do something worthwhile and challenging. There's no points for the ring muscle-up. It's just, it's an afterthought. Like, of course you can do a beautiful, strict, super slow, effortless ring muscle up over and over and over again. Of course you can. I mean, this is gymnastics. So now when we ask ourselves, how is our gymnastics capacity? We are at the base of the mountain looking up at Mount Everest. 
And so now when we take a step back between weightlifting, monostructural and gymnastics, and the common question is most people will say, I think that I need to lift more. I don't agree. I don't think that you do. I think that most people, they need everything. And, and you know, the words I just said a second ago, they're very un unfiltered and truthful and hopefully they didn't come off as too harsh. I'm in that camp as well. I need to improve my Olympic, lift, Olympic lifts. They're not where I'd like them to be. But guess what? Neither is my 800. Um, and I know that I've got a lot of work to do left on my gymnastics, but I, I'm, as all of us are, we're a constant work in progress. And uh, our goal is to just keep moving those things forward. You know, we want to, we may not beat Olympic lifters at the Olympic lifts, but we're certainly gonna outlift the runners. We not, might not be able to, you know, and we play that game with everything else. We can outlift the gymnast, blah, blah, blah. You know, and that's, it's that, that jack of all trades is what we're looking for with CrossFit. And so our goal is to, to put out programming and training that allows our athletes to continually move those three big building blocks of weightlifting, monostructural, and gymnastics to advance them forward in a way that is sustainable and complements one, one another. Um, and it's a heck of a balancing act. You know, it's, it's a heck of a symphony, uh, symphony to do. So, yeah. So again, that was just a, a quick little chat there. And that, and that is, um, you know, like what I just said there about gymnastics, where in the world of gymnastics, we have so much room to work on. Hopefully that's not meant to be defeating. You know, that's just, these are just real statements about the world of weightlifting, actual running times and then the world of gymnastics, you know, and we're not trying to be power lifters or Olympic lifters or gymnasts or 800 meter run specialists. We're trying to be these amazing robots of fitness that can kind of do it all and do it all pretty darn well, quite frankly. And, and I think we, and I think we excel at that. Now I'll end on this. Uh, before we get into the linchpin testimonials. Holy cow, how have we gone 50 minutes? Uh, I'll end with this, uh, Eddie, as well. There is a difference, and I've mentioned this before in some um, podcasts, of want versus need. So in your question, in my mind, interlaced in your question is the word need. There's this sense of that people need a bit more lifting and you know if they had that then it would benefit them that's that's where i have the you know that's where i disagree based upon everything that i just said previously now if we there's a difference between what people want and what they need my job as the head of linchpin is to give people what they need because if you give people what they want all the time eh, it usually doesn't work out so well but we live in a wonderful world where you have incredible freedoms and you're supposed to enjoy working out and you're supposed to have fun, right? And we are just working out at the end of the day. People like to really just nuke it and drop a bomb on it and make it just stressful and complicated. And you know, you can, you can make it as stressful and complicated as you want, but you have to have fun or you're not gonna wanna walk into the gym tomorrow. So guess what? If you just happen to be the sort of individual that you love lifting, it just, warms your heart and puts a huge smile on your face almost like nothing else then by all means do some extra lifting i want I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart i want you to have fun when you're working out because if you don't you won't stick with it so if a bit of extra bench press on the side or some extra deads or whatever it happens to be just makes you grin from ear to ear have at it absolutely have at it and uh, and the world will be a better place. So that's it. But once again, if you want to d dive even deeper, linchpin conversations number 42, entitled Extra Lifting is Not What Most People Need to Improve Their Fitness, I think will be uh, a good resource as well. So hopefully that happens. And I'm here to tell you, I see uh, Jason just you know wrote down Iron Cross. Right, <laughs> exactly, Iron Cross for gymnastics. You know, I I'm married to somebody that is not only a, a two times individual games athlete, 
but my wife was also a competitive collegiate gymnast her entire life and you know got a full ride scholarship to University of Washington D1 blah 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 and so I've had an ability to pick her brain about you know gymnastics and the training and the level of complexity and whatnot and I'll tell you what I don't know anything else that holds a candle to actual high level gymnastics weightlifting doesn't come close I just it's just what those individuals can do is psychotic and there's so much benefit there for us as regular people even just playing with the progressions on some of those more challenging movements you know so in the in the private track under the accessory work you know we have um you know candlestick conditioning drills and you know um planche progressions which you know i'm sure none of us have a planche but there's a you know a 10 or 12 step progression and even if you make it one or two steps into that planche progression you may never get a planche but the adaptation and strength that you will build from even just playing with whatever step in the progression is appropriate for you is through the roof but it's not sexy and it doesn't look good on instagram nobody's posting that stuff it's never going to have this big following because it's so darn hard it's so darn humbling and it's going to be that way for a very long time and it's easy to just give up on it but those that don't will be ferocious beasts of strength so all right i think everybody tricked me into a bit of a rabbit hole that was not very fair that wasn't fair all right let's uh Let's end with a couple of our linchpin shoutouts, you know, screenshots that I do from the um, private track, uh, the Facebook group every week when I see something cool. I miss plenty of it, obviously, but I try to get some cool stuff. First one, anonymous, but it's from a, a gentleman who was in the army and had some significant injuries or whatnot and sadly had some, some bad experiences um, with some previous gyms or trainers, which breaks my heart. And don't give me, there's, it's easy for just the bad stories to make headlines. There's obviously a tremendous amount of affiliates out there crushing it and doing it right. But sadly, this individual had a couple bad experiences and just felt bad, uh, felt some shame if he had to, you know, scale, was made to feel a certain way, you know, pressure to do it RX and anyway, so he just loves the fact that we're so, like, scaling is cool. Do what you need to do to make the best decision for your body and your capacity and where you are. And that's not only the smart thing to do, but it will keep you in this game for a very long time. And we just don't want you, want you working out for a month or two. We want you working out for years. And so, yeah, scaling is cool. So that, that made me very happy. All right, next thing we have here. Um... Uh, real life, real talk is what I entitled this. This one is from Amy, Amy R. And she says, I was happy just to work out today. I have a 16 month old who won't sleep. We are in an area with tight COVID restrictions in the UK. Work has been stressful. The weather is grim. My body wasn't primed for anything hard today. So I left my ego in the house, stuck on, put on some good tunes and cracked on with the workout at an easier pace. What I love about Lynchpin is that you don't have to smash it every day or try to kill yourself. It's great for people with busy, stressful lives. Take care. 100%. 100%. Life is stressful enough. There's no need to stress yourself out about didn't do the workout perfectly, had to modify something, blah, blah, blah. Just, just get in some fitness, move your body, and on those days that life works out well, you can try to be a hero those days, but on the other days, we're just trying to get it in. Uh, this one's from Paul. In the Netherlands, there will be a five-week lockdown as of tomorrow. So, um, he's embracing basically the limited equipment and no equipment workouts will be his recipe for the next five weeks. So, for sure, as, as COVID lockdowns hit again. Colton. Colton hit a local competition with a mask on, of course. Just wanted to share that this last weekend, my partner and I took first place in the men's intermediate division at a local competition in North Carolina. Very cool, happy to see you getting out there and having some fun. Mads, Mads posted pain-free clean and jerk. He, um, let's see, 
working on these lifts. My clean and jerk today was about 63 kilos, and that's a little bit of a PR I'm happy about, but the big deal, no pain in my lower back equals good day. That makes me happier than any number on the bar. Pain-free is the way to be. Uh, Benjamin Ryan got himself a clean and jerk PR. Congratulations. James, James L. had a great post. Um, it's a couple paragraphs long. I'm going to read it, but it's worthwhile. And he got a ton of feedback on it when he posted positive feedback. So here's what James had to say. So 2020 is the first year I've worked out five times a week, every week. Haven't missed one. To be honest, the consistency has been awesome. I've really enjoyed it. But my problem is, as I went, quote unquote, as prescribed on nearly every workout and didn't release the pressure valve through scaling, so no scaling, no modifications, even when he didn't feel 100%, he still didn't scale or modify, and he didn't do any of the workouts not for time, you know, like we program once a week, I basically went as hard as I could on uh, nearly every workout. This led to now in the month of December, taking the entire month off to work on my lower back rehab, strict strength and core development. In other words, I burnt myself out. For me, I approach my training with the mindset of consistency and intensity is king, which isn't wrong, but didn't realize, but I didn't really pay much attention to external life, work, relationships, social stress, et cetera, et cetera, which obviously massively affect everything else. For this reason, and to end my essay, I am committing to performing every workout in January, scaled, modified, or not for time. Absolutely love that. Uh, that was a very honest and open post from James, and I think that's a, I think that's a subject that you know we speak about regularly, right? Intensity is a beautiful thing, and it drives results, and it's mission critical. But intensity is also relative to the individual, and intensity, and even high intensity can often be confused with maximal intensity. And it's a very rare human being that can try to bring maximal intensity to the table every day on every workout and not eventually run into a wall. It took James all year. James is obviously a beast. Some people might hit that wall in three days. Some people might hit it in three months, three weeks. It took James a year, but you will eventually hit that wall. So don't confuse high intensity with maximal intensity. And also, you have to modulate that just like everything else, right? That's why we have the not for time days. That's why you should fully take and embrace your rest days. And that's why, you know, like I said, Tuesday was five by 500 meter row, which was a short time domain, very high intensity day. Yesterday on the three rounder, I allowed myself just to go at moderate intensity because you have to modulate that like everything else, or you will hit some level of burnout. And this is a, we actually chatted about this very subject a few episodes ago. So make sure you catch that as well. And then lastly, um, let's see, Jocelyn, Jocelyn B, my first handstand pushup ever, and she managed three. Congratulations. That is absolutely awesome and a heck of an achievement. Once again, I love these Ask Me Anything. They're super fun. Hopefully they are valuable to everybody. Enjoy the rest of your rest day, and we will talk again soon.